Good morning, church. This morning we're going to be reading from Luke 23, chapter 23, uh, verses 26 through 43 in Jeremiah. We'll go through those later or in a moment. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put a cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung their snor... One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus Remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Man, this is really hard to watch. I know what you mean. Just by looking at them and listening to them, you can tell that they're in agony. It must be even worse for Jesus. Not only is he going through physical torture, but nearly everyone around him is mocking him. Even the criminal next to him said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other criminal made a good point though when he said, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence? We are being punished justly, but this man did nothing wrong. That criminal just said, Jesus. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me when you come into my kingdom. What's Jesus saying? Today, you will be with me in paradise. That sounds nice. I wonder if I could get into paradise. Well, I don't understand it all, but from what I do know, Jesus is the only way there. That Jesus? Yeah. Jesus made it perfectly clear when he spoke on this topic that you can't be saved because of your good works. He even said that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, you won't make it. I couldn't do that. I can't either. But Jesus did. I think maybe that's the point. Good morning, church. (laughs) How's everybody doing this morning? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're picking back up with our seven sayings from the cross series as we look at Jesus on the cross and the things that he said and the importance of them. But I'm pretty sure that the question on most of our minds is, how is Pastor doing? Right? For those of you who don't know, Pastor did have an angiogram done this last week, and he's actually here today. And so he's right over there. So he's doing well. Stand up, say hi. And so you can go hug and love on him later. But as we continue this, this series, as we look at this, we're going to be looking at actually the second saying in the series is, today you will be with me in paradise. 
And as we look at the cross, one of the things I really want us to grasp before we even get to the sayings so we can understand the weight and the importance of these sayings, actually what's happening around the cross. And the truth is, what's going on right now, if we could kind of zoom in from like space and look at what's going on in Jerusalem at this point, this is literally zooming into the middle of the world in the middle of the time, to see, in the middle of time, to see the most important thing in history. And so what, one of the things I want to talk about is at the time of, of Jesus' death and at the time of his birth, Roman rule is actually over all the world. They have, they have done something that has never been accomplished before and has never been accomplished since. The Romans achieved what is called the Pax Romana, which is world peace. And for the first time in history, the world is at peace. And it's never happened since, since the fall of Rome. Since the fall of Rome, the world has been in constant turmoil like it was beforehand. The language that was in, in spoken at this point in time was Greek, which is almost a perfect language. That's what the New Testament is written in. So we have a perfect language, a perfect time, and a perfect world. And then what happens is the Romans built the Roman roads. And you've heard the saying, all roads lead to... Rome, because Rome thought they were the center of the world. But the truth is, Israel always has been and always will be the center of our world. In fact, I want to show you exactly where Israel is at. Go ahead and pull this up. If you look at this map here, just to kind of give us a, a bearing here, the big land mass in the lower left-hand corner is Africa. And so up towards the, the top on the left, that's France and Spain. That's Italy and Europe up in there. And then to the right is... Um, is Asia and all of that, and then the, the landmass in the middle there is kind of is uh, Saudi Arabia. But where you see Jerusalem, you see the word Jerusalem? That's not actually where Jerusalem is at. Jerusalem is one of those red dots that are piled all together right there at Pella. And so this is the, the Fertile Crescent. And so this is actually Israel is the piece of land that connects all the continents together. And so the trade routes had to go through Israel and Jerusalem, which made Jerusalem the center of the world. It made it important. And this is why the kingdoms of Israel were able to be built up so well. That's why Solomon and David had such wealthy kingdoms. It's because all of the trade had to go through there. And that's why Israel was, was so wanted by all the other nations. It's because if they controlled the land that connected everything together, they would have wealth and power. And so in the time of the Roman rule... Israel is still the middle of the world, just as it is today, but it's peace time. And what happens, the way that the Romans acquired peace is when they conquered the world, they didn't go in and say, you are now slaves. They went into the nations like Israel and said, we want you to continue being Israel. We want you to continue your religion. We want you to continue worshiping at your temple. Rome is over you, and you'll pay homage and taxes to Rome, but you are still Israel. Act like it. And so what happened is because of all these road systems, so not only did Israel continue to flourish, but then the Jews and the Israelites, because of the Old Testament, remember when they were taken into slavery and taken to Babylon, they were already spread out. But because of the Roman roads and because of the time of peace, you could travel safely. So now the Israel, nation of Israel and Jews had spread all over the world. And what's going on as we read what's happening at the cross right now is the center of the world, Jerusalem, is in what's called Passover. And Passover is like the festival of festivals. That's when Jews from all over the world would come back to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And so the population of Jerusalem at this point in time has actually exploded. So Jerusalem is packed with people and Jews from all over the world. And we're going to see one of them in just a minute. And so what's going on is literally Rome sees what's going on here. This is the center. And they have Pontius Pilate, who's in charge of the Roman rule over Jerusalem. And one of the things that we can understand here is the cross that Jesus died on, the crucifixion, the, the, the death, the public execution, was already planned before Jesus came into town. In fact, the, they were going to kill three people that day, and this is why the Jewish leaders were hustling so much in the middle of the night to try and get this done, was so that they could get Jesus killed instead of who was supposed to be killed that day. The three crosses were meant for a man named Barabbas, who was a thief and a murderer and somebody who was an insurrectionist against Rome. He was a horrible man. And his two, two of his gang, which would have been the two thieves that were actually crucified on each side of Jesus. So the cross that Jesus died on was actually supposed to be for the man Barabbas. 
And so this execution was already in play. And so what's happening is the population of Jerusalem is exploding. Jesus has become popular because he's healing people. The, the Israelite leaders, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin are jealous of Jesus and his power. So they're doing everything they can at this point to get Jesus killed before Passover, before he can cause even more because the whole world is coming together in Jerusalem for Passover. And so what ends up happening, and we know the story, it's, we call it Passion Week, and Monday comes and Jesus, Jesus comes in on a donkey into Jerusalem as a king, and people put palm branches below him, and they worship him, Hosanna. And, but what we want to focus on, what I want us to understand is all the actions that lead up to the cross so we can understand the weight of the saying. So if you'll bring up, I've got something I want to show you here. This looks really confusing, and I know that. We're going to go through it really quickly, and I, you'll, you'll understand. The red arrows that you see on here, are actually the journey of Jesus starting on Thursday night to the cross. And so if we start down here in the left-hand corner, it says, number one, Thursday, Jesus shares the Passover meal with his disciples. So they believe that, historians believe that he shared the Passover meal in the Essene quarter, which is down there in the kind of lower left hand, and that's where he spent the time with the disciples. That's when Judas left during the, during the, the Lord's Supper, to, or the last Passover meal, to go and betray him. And they leave there, and they follow that big red arrow that goes all the way up to the Garden of Gethsemane at the top. So they journey to the Garden of Gethsemane. And a lot of the teaching that we see in John when Jesus teaches at the, at the Passover, a lot of it actually happens on that journey from the upper room to the garden. They get to the garden, and Jesus prays. And we know the prayer. If, this, if there's any other way, let this cup pass by me, right? But your will be done, but not mine. And so and then it's at the garden where Jesus is arrested and Judas shows up and betrays him. So this all happens Thursday night. It's late in the evening by this point. So Thursday night they arrest him and they take him Thursday night to number four, back to the scene quarter, which is where uh, the, the head priest, Cyphus, his house is at, and they put on a mock trial. And they, they basically try him in this midnight court, this fake court, and they have people come and tell lies about Jesus. He did this, or he did that, or he said this, or he said this. And Jesus remains silent and doesn't defend himself. And so Caiaphas, they're trying to find a reason to find Jesus guilty. So they abuse him and beat him, spit on him. So they decide, let's take him to the Sanhedrin. So early Friday morning, they end up at the temple, which is where the Sanhedrin is, is, is gathering together to try Jesus. And again, what they're trying to look for a reason to kill Jesus, to find him guilty of something, and people are lying about him. And finally, the head priest asks him, you said you were the Messiah. Is it true? And Jesus' response is, it is as you say. And at that point, the head priest goes, we don't need any more testimonies. He has claimed to be God, and that is blasphemy. He deserves death. So they beat him and spit in his face more, and they drag him over to number six over here, which is uh, before Pontius Pilate. And so he stands before Pontius Pilate, and Pilate can't find anything wrong. He's not a Jew, so he doesn't have a problem with Jesus claiming to be the Messiah. And he doesn't know why the Jews are rallying against Jesus to kill him. So Pilate, at this point, says, this man is not guilty of anything. But he realizes Herod's in town, and that Jesus is from a place called Gethsemane. And Herod is actually in charge of Gethsemane. So he says, you know what? I don't want anything to do with Jesus, so send him to Herod. And so he goes from Herod, or from, from Pilate, over to number seven, which is almost across the street. Friday morning, Jesus before Herod Antipas. And Herod doesn't care about what the Jews are saying. What he wants to see is Jesus do some miracles. And so he's not even caring about the trial. He's like, I've heard of all the things you do, and I've been wanting to meet you. Show me how powerful you are. And Jesus remains silent and will not show many miracles. So Herod gets frustrated and says, you think you're a king, I'll treat you like a king. And they has him beat and covered with a royal robe to pretend that he's a king. And the soldiers beat him and mock him as if he's a powerless king. And Herod says, I want nothing to do with this and sends him back to Pilate. And we end up back at Pilate's house, number eight, Friday morning. And Jesus again before Pilate. Pilate's wife had a dream saying, don't have anything to do with this man. So she goes to Pilate and says, don't do anything with Jesus. Just let him go. I've had a dream. It's been tormenting me all night. So Pilate, Pilate in his, in his attempt to get out from underneath of what is going on here, takes Jesus and has him flogged. So he's already been beaten, but at this point he is now being flogged. And what flogged is, is basically it's an art form. It's they're able to beat somebody within an inch of their life without killing them. 
So he takes Jesus and beats him to the point where he is almost dead. And the, the prophecy says that he was, he was beaten beyond recognition, that even his own mother would not be able to recognize him at this point. And he brings Jesus back before the Jews in the Sanhedrin and says, look what I've done. This man does not deserve death, but look what I've done to him. This is enough. And the Jews say, no, we want to kill him. And so he goes, okay, well, this is, this is your tradition. This is what we do. I have in my custody a man named Barabbas. And it is our custom to give you, the Jews, the opportunity to pardon one person at Passover. Now, we have to remember, Rome is in rule at this point, right? All of the world is coming to a focus in Jerusalem because the Jews are all coming back for Passover. What better way to peacefully show all of Israel and all the world that Rome is still in charge than by doing a public execution? The execution of Barabbas was already Planned. So as people came into Jerusalem, they would see these people on a Roman cross. See, the Romans were the only one that could use the cross to kill. The crucifix, the cross, was a Roman tool of death. And it was a shameful death. And the Romans were the only ones that used it. And so by putting people on a cross, that showed the Romans were in charge. In fact, Romans would not put Romans on the cross. It was only reserved for non-Romans. That's why we don't see Paul crucified on a cross. Traditionally, the church shows that he was executed outside of town because he was a Roman citizen, so therefore a cross would have been too shameful for Paul. And so what better way to peacefully show the world than to put onto public display on this day of the uh, time of Passover, the Romans, Romans are in charge. They have the power to execute. And so he puts them up there and says, we have Barabbas and we have Jesus. Who do you want? And we know the story. They all Give us Barabbas, and they yell, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him for Jesus. So Jesus ends up on Barabbas' cross, and the two thieves on the either side of Jesus would have been part of Barabbas' gang. And when we think of thieves, they're not thieves like we think of. When we think of thieves, we think of uh, maybe um, a cat burglar, somebody breaking into a house and stealing things, or a car thief or something like that. The thieves that they would have been, would have been the kind that would catch you on a road and kill you and take all of your stuff. They were murdering thieves, murderous thieves. And so they take Barabbas and they let him go. And Pilate says, all right, I wash my hands of this. And he releases Jesus to be crucified. And then you'll see that little red arrow there at the top. It looks like a hook. That's the journey from, from the palace where, where Pilate would have been at to the cross. And that's where we pick up today. So we kind of understand the background and the whole events that happened from Thursday night to Friday morning. And it is, it is a, a crazy time that is going on. And Jesus, by this point, is completely exhausted. And that's where we find in chapter 23, verse 26, is where we pick him up. And it says in verse 26, as the soldiers led him away, they're leaving Pilate and they're heading towards Golgotha. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. So we see the cross is too too heavy at this point for Jesus to carry because by this point, congestive heart failure because of the beatings have started to set in, fever has started to set in. Jesus is hardly able to stand out of his own power, let alone the, 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 the weight of the cross. And so it would have been shameful for the Romans to let Jesus die on the road instead of on the cross because that's not what they did. That would have shown that they were bad at their task. So what they do is what Romans have the ability to do, Roman soldiers, is they're able to take somebody and assign them a job. And so they grab this guy named Simon of Cyrene and they grab him and make him carry Jesus' cross. And really he didn't want to do it. But what happened, Simon of Cyrene is from Africa. Cyrene is Africa, 800 miles away. And Simon's not part of the scene. See, what's going on is this is now almost 9 o'clock in the morning. And what happens now in this busy time of, of Jerusalem where the city is now overcrowded, everyone is headed to the temple to pray. It's the time of prayer at 9 o'clock in the morning. So in the middle of all this commotion and the word is spread, Barabbas is not going to be killed. Jesus is taking his place. In the middle of this commotion at the time of year, when Jerusalem is the most crowded and people all know who Jesus is and they start to see when they're on their way to the temple to pray that morning, Jesus is now on his way to the cross. A crowd has begun to gather around everyone. 
and they're starting to follow Jesus. Simon's on his way to the temple to pray. He's not there because he's following Jesus. He's there because he's a good Jew for Passover. He's come to participate in the Passover festival. So he's on his way to the temple and they grab him and make him carry this cross. And this is a shameful thing for Simon, who has traveled over 800 miles to be in Jerusalem. Because first of all, he's being associated with guilt because he's carrying the cross. This is shameful for his family. So he picks up the cross of Jesus. And then he's being associated with blood and death, which makes him ceremonially unclean, which means that he is now no longer able to participate in the things he wanted to do with Passover because he has to go through a ceremony cleaning in order to participate, to be able to go in the temple. The temple would see him as unclean at this point. This is the worst place in the world that Simon could be. But we learn he comes face to face with Jesus, and we see in the Gospels that actually later, Simon, because he was here, becomes a believer. So what he thought was the worst place to be was the best place for him to be. And in fact, the reason we know he's a believer is because they mention, the Gospels mentions his sons in the church. And this is Simon of Cyrene, whose sons are this person and this person. We know him because they're involved in the church that is following Jesus. So they, we see this amazing thing happen, what he thinks is the worst, and it echoes out of Genesis and the end of Genesis, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, and Simon comes to know Christ. And as he continues down this road, he's carrying the cross because Jesus cannot. Verse 27 says, A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never born, the breasts that never cursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if people do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? One of the things we see here is we get to the sayings on the cross is Jesus is completely selfless. The whole world is watching him die. And he turns to these ladies who have come, and their hearts are broken. And a lot of them minister to the people on the cross. That's what they do in their roles in Jerusalem. And they're weeping because Jesus is dying, and he turns to them because Jesus is God, and he knows the future. He knows 40 years from now, Jerusalem is going to revolt against Rome. And Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. The temple's going to be destroyed. And Jesus is telling him, don't worry about me. Weep for yourselves because what is coming. Be aware of what is coming. It's not about what's happening to me right now. And so as they continue down, it says, verse 32, two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. So we see Jesus, and we all have this imagery, we've all seen it before in the Easter imagery, three crosses on a hill, and the middle one is Jesus. And that is true. That's, we see that in the, wor- in the word right here. And the reason for that is the middle, where we, what we call like the place of honor, it was the place of shame. The middle showed that he was the worst. See, remember that was Barabbas' cross. He would have been the leader. And so they put Jesus in the middle to focus on this is the worst. There may be murdering thieves, but this man, Jesus, is really who we want to die. And then one of the most amazing things happens, and we hear the first words from the cross. Now, could you imagine? The whole world is focused on this at this moment in time. Even today, we still focus. The whole world focuses on Easter and the cross and the resurrection. And what happens is this crowd has gathered. And in this crowd, there are followers of Jesus Followers of Jesus who know at any moment Jesus could end this. At any moment, he just has to say a word, and this is all over. He's off the cross, he's in his glory, and it is done, right? He can finish this and show them. Then there's the religious leaders who show a stark contrast to the graceful God who is dying on the cross for the sinners, for the sinners and everyone who lives on earth. He is showing the ultimate grace and the contrast between him and the religious leaders, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the, and the Sanhedrin, who are there mocking him. And Jesus is showing on the cross that he's willing to die because all life is precious. And the religious leaders are showing we get to determine which life is precious. And they mock him. And they mock him. And then Jesus, who at this point is 
is it takes everything to speak. We think that this conversation, there wasn't conversations on the cross. It took everything in his physical being to even get a sentence out, begins to speak. And then really it was probably just a whisper. And the crowd goes silent because the people who were there that believed wanted to know if he was ending it. The people there who didn't believe that were mocking him wanted to know what his response to their mocking was. And out of his mouth comes the first saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The saying of grace. And that's it. He remains silent after that. But could you imagine the forgiveness? And I know we've already touched on this. We've already talked about this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But it's important for us to understand this statement before we go to the next statement. So Jesus whispers this. And you can imagine, it probably wasn't heard because the crowd is big. It probably started at the front of the crowd and began to work its way through the crowd. What did he say? He said, Father, forgive us, for we don't know what we're doing. And those who believe are, are, are brokenhearted. And for those who are mocking, they think that he has no idea what he's talking about. And then the soldiers in verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching. Now, I have never been to a public execution. And I hope I never attend one. But honestly, I wouldn't know how to behave. I, I, I wouldn't know what emotions I'm supposed to feel or not feel or what was okay to say or not okay to say. And so this crowd is full of mixed emotions. And then it says the leaders, the rulers, sneered at him as they said, he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is God's Messiah, the chosen one, then he should be able to take care of this. He's not God. Look what we're doing. Look what we're doing to him. Then the soldiers jumped in. The soldiers also came up and mocked him, and they, they offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. So we got the leaders and the rulers who are supposed to be the spiritual leaders showing people how to live godly lives, and they're mocking Jesus in death. Then the soldiers get involved, and they're mocking Jesus in death. And they're saying, If you really are God, then save yourself. We want to see it. And then above him is a sign that says, the king of the Jews. See, what happens is when somebody's crucified, the Romans would hang a placard around their neck, and on it would be the crime that they had committed. So if they were, if they were a murderer, they would wear a placard that said, murderer, as they carried their cross to be crucified, and then that would have to be worn by them until they died. That was their judgment. That's what they were guilty of. Pilate's the one that put king of the Jews. John tells us that it was written in three languages because this is the center of the world. It would have been written in Greek, which is the language of the, of the empire. It would have been written in Hebrew because that's the native language. And then it would have been written in Aramaic because that was the trade language of that area. And so it was actually written in three languages so that anybody walking by would know what he was guilty of. And he was guilty of being the king of the Jews. And it's interesting to me, as we look at Jesus, and I'm just, i got to be honest here. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. We call it the hyperstatic union. We don't understand it completely how it works, but he wasn't 50% man. He wasn't 50% God. He was all man and all God, the hyperstatic, supernatural com combination of these two things into one. Now, I can tell you, if I was Jesus, and I'm not, please don't mistake me, but if I was Jesus and everyone was mocking me, if you're really God, get yourself off that cross, guess what I would do? You want to see what I can do? I'll show you what I can do. See, the ignorance of those that were mocking him didn't realize that if he did come off the cross, they were destroyed. And as you think about this and who Jesus was, the temptation, the ultimate temptation of the man of Jesus would have been to show them, you want to see what I can do? It tells us in the next paragraph, the next part of this chapter, at noon, we're just talking about the, actually the crucifixion was six hours long. We're just talking about the first three hours, but at noon, it says the sky went black. The sky went black. And this is, this is me speaking. I'm just going to give you Jeremiah spin. This is, not what, what, this is not what the Bible says, but it doesn't tell us why the sky went black. It just says the sun quit shining, the sky went black. The reason I believe the sky went black is because while the world was watching Jesus die, heaven was watching Jesus die. And every single one of the angels of the heavenly armies, the same ones that proclaimed his birth to the shepherds, were ready to move if Jesus decided to end it. And at that point in time, heaven drew close to earth, and they were ready. 
and obedient. Their swords were put away. But I guarantee you, Michael, the archangel, had his hand on the handle, ready at any moment. So I give, I give you that two cents. That's free. That's not biblical. That's not what the Bible is. That's just my, that's what I believe as I look at that. Heaven drew close to earth that day as we see that the sky drew dark. And I think of Jesus on the cross with the angels there watching, with man mocking. How did he do that? How did he stay there in the grace? And then I remember the beginning when John baptized Jesus. He took him to the desert, right? You remember this? Jesus went for 40 days into the desert and fasted. He didn't eat anything for 40 days. And at four, on the 40th day, Satan shows up to tempt him. And at 40 days, Jesus is starving. His body is starting to eat itself from the inside out. There's no strength. You're not thinking right. And Satan says, hey, take this rock and turn it into bread and eat so you'll feel better. And Jesus responds with scripture. And he says, it is written that man shall not eat by bread alone. Say it, bread. Bread alone. And so he rebukes Satan with scripture. It's written, no bread, man shall not eat by bread alone. And so he's like, okay. So he takes Jesus to the top of the temple, the highest point of the temple. He says, throw yourself off this temple. Throw yourself off this temple and let your angels catch you because they will not let you die. And then Jesus responds with, with scripture and says, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test. And then Satan takes Jesus and says, look at all of this, the whole world. I rule over this. If you bow down to me, I will give it all to you. And Jesus responds, it is written, there shall not have any other gods before me. And he rebukes Satan three times and resists the temptation. And as I was reading this week, it all of a sudden came into focus. That wasn't Jesus' greatest temptation. As a man standing on the cross, hanging on the cross, he was prepared to stay there. The greatest temptation would have been to put it to an end. But his grace and his love for you and me kept him on the cross. And then we find him at the place of the most shame in between two murderous thieves. Matthew and Mark tells us something. Matthew and Mark tells us that both of these thieves were actually in on the mocking at the beginning. It says that both the thieves mocked Jesus and said, if you are the Messiah, then save all of us. But then we get to Luke, and Luke gives us a little bit more insight into what actually happens after they mock him. And you see, the first thief, when Jesus said those words of grace, remember I said it was important that we understand when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he spoke that word of grace and that prayer of grace over everyone. It changed the heart of one of the thieves. And they saw Jesus for who he was for the first time. And that thief then began to believe in his heart that Jesus was who he said he was. And then we see here, verse 38, read this with me. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who hung there hurled incense, insults at him. Are you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. So they're on the cross. Now, we have to understand the thieves are in a better condition than Jesus. Jesus has gone through a lot more than the thieves have. So they're actually able to have a conversation at this point. They may have been beaten, but they weren't flogged. They're in a bad place, but they weren't as bad as Jesus was. And they begin this conversation. And one of the thieves says, you know, save us. And the other one responds, don't, don't you fear God? We're all condemned to die right now. All three of us are serving the same sentence of death. You and I, they knew each other. They were friends. You and I deserve this. We are guilty. He hasn't done anything wrong. And then he turns to Jesus and says, Jesus... When you come into your kingdom, will you remember me? Now, Romans 10, 8, 9 tells us if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. We will be saved. And here is a thief proclaiming that Jesus is innocent, that Jesus is a king, that he has power in his kingdom, and that his kingdom is eternal because it's after death. And he says, Jesus, he asks humbly, he doesn't say, Jesus, Will you give me a position in your kingdom? He just simply, humbly says, Jesus, will you remember me? And then we get the second saying from the cross. And I don't know, we don't know how much strength or how much pain or how much energy it took for Jesus to reply. But at this point, he had not acknowledged the thieves. 
And this thief acknowledges Jesus. And it echoes the saying that Jesus said, if you acknowledge me before men, I will acknowledge you before my Father in heaven. And I imagine the joy of Jesus understanding that this thief just right next to him is coming to the salvation, the saving grace of knowing who Jesus is. He turns to him and says, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And that thief has the confidence of eternity now. So we see the power of the second statement. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So what do we learn from this? How do we apply this? Well, the first thing we can learn from this, number one, is that the forgiveness on the cross that Jesus gives is for everyone. We need to understand that. And see, when you, when you talk about salvation, when you talk about the gospel with people, one of the biggest pushbacks we give is pastor if you only knew the things I've done, then you would know Jesus couldn't forgive me, right? And I'll be honest with you, all of us have felt that way at some point in time. Pastor, if you only know the things that I, I've been involved with or the things I've done, if you knew how bad my life has been, you would know that Jesus wouldn't forgive me. The cross shows us that Jesus forgives everyone. This thief didn't have time to get off the cross and turn his life around. He didn't have time to make it right with everybody else. Jesus forgave him for being a murderous thief because he had faith in who Jesus was. So let's build this bridge and get over this together. It doesn't matter what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter where you're at or what's going on. Jesus' forgiveness on the cross covers it. It always has. It always will. It doesn't matter who you think you are because salvation is always about who Jesus is and what he did. And our God is bigger than anything that we can do wrong. And so on that cross that day, Jesus proved to us salvation and forgiveness is for everyone. It doesn't matter who they are, what they've done, or where they're at. And that, to me, is good news. I, you could come up to me and say, you know what, Jeremiah, you really don't know what I've done. I said, I'll be honest with you, I really don't care. Please don't tell me. Right? Let's not get, I really don't want to know because that may change how I think about you. I hope not, but that's not for me. God has forgiven you, right? And so as we stand here today, if you are here today and you have stood against salvation because you don't think you're good enough for it, the news is none of us are good enough for it. Jesus died for it, and it's yours freely. Amen? Amen. Number two. Number two, what we learn here as we look at this. Today I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. We often emphasize paradise. And can I tell you as a Christian, that's wrong. Jesus could have said anything there. In fact, he could have just left it, today you will be with me. It doesn't matter what comes next. Jesus could have said, you will be with me at Taco Bell. Praise the Lord, I'm with Jesus, Right? Doesn't matter. You could be with today you'll be with me in Arkansas or Africa or wherever. The goal and the reward is not paradise. Paradise is paradise because Jesus is there. And so as Christians, we need to renew our minds and how we think heaven is not our reward. Jesus is. And we need to stop chasing heaven and start chasing Christ. Heaven's heaven because that's where Jesus is. So if we start living today, in fact, if you go back and look at all the teachings about Jesus, he's very, he talks about heaven, but it's often very vague. What he talks more about is how we live our life like today so we can become more like him today. And so as Christians, we may need to renew our minds and how we think and stop chasing after heaven and start chasing after Christ because paradise is not the goal. It's just the icing on the cake. Jesus is the cake. Amen? And so we might need to rethink that process because that will change how we live. If we're chasing heaven, we're waiting. If we're chasing Christ, we're living. Number three. Number three. As we look at this cross, and if you have this imagery, three crosses, Jesus is on the middle and two thieves on each side. Every single one of us ends up on one of those crosses. Every person that's ever lived and every person that ever will live ends up on one side of Jesus or the other. And I want us to go back, if we look there are those that believe and confess in their, with their hearts, with, confess with their mouths what they believe with their heart, and they will be with Jesus for eternity. And there are those that can't see it. And they go into eternity. See, as so we look at today, you will be with me. Just the logical progression. Can you guys understand this? Today, to one person, you will be with me 
forever. The logical progression is today, you will never have a part of me. You will go into eternity without me. One guy gets to be with Jesus. One guy never gets to see him again. That's the definition of hell, is existence without God. So I don't care what your, what your visualization of hell is or how you picture it. The truth is eternity with Christ or the eternity without all of us end up on one of those crosses and make that decision one way or the other. But I want us to draw back, if we can, back to the thief, the one that believed. And I want us to look at his words one last time. Verse 39, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read this to you. Actually, verse 40. But the other criminal rebuked him. He was talking to his friend. He says, don't you fear God, he said. Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. What we see here on the cross, it says he rebuked him. This isn't that he was angry. Remember, they had done things together that Jesus would never forgive us for, right? That we couldn't imagine some of the things they've done, some of the people they've killed, some of the things they've taken. And he looks at them and he rebukes them. And it wasn't to rebuke him because he was mad at him. It's because he knew he had just come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And he could see Jesus who, for who Jesus was. And the other one couldn't. And the rebuking was not anger or frustration. It was evangelism. It was for him to understand who Jesus was. It says, no, no, you've got it wrong. Don't you get it? This is God. You and I deserve this. He doesn't. See, there's a role there. The Bible tells us as we look at this, as we look at those two crosses, the majority of the world's probably going to end up on the one that mocks Christ and doesn't see him for who he is. That saddens my heart. But there's hope. And we see it in the, in, the, in the thief that believed because he didn't want his friend to go to hell. And that's your role and my role. We don't get to dictate who ends up on which cross, but we get to be a part of the amazing blessing of being part of the process. And your role and my role is to rebuke with a full heart because we don't want the people around us to not know Jesus. We don't want the people around us to go into eternity without Jesus. So today, if you are here today and you have been keeping Jesus at arm's length, you like what church is about and you've been coming to church, I don't care if you've been in church your whole life, but if you have never accepted the free gift of forgiveness because you think that what you've done is so bad, today's your day. You need to come forward because we're not promised to tomorrow. But today you can know for sure that if something were to happen to you, you'd be with Jesus. Today needs to be your day. In Thanks for joining us, and we hope you have a great week. We can't wait to see you next time here at South Peoria Baptist Church.